Uh, thank you, everyone that um, has or is joining us uh, today, and um, thank you that um, to, to everyone that joined um, this series last week. And as you know, this is a um, a set of four talks that look at the interplay between corpus linguistics and different areas in applied linguistics. Today we have Dr. Gavin Brooks, University of Lancaster. And um, he will be talking about the representation of uh, obesity in in the in the media. We are, are all very looking forward to his presentation uh, today. Uh, Dr. Joyce Lim, Joyce will be joining us today. She is a former PhD student, University of Cambridge, now at Aston University. She will chair the uh, Q and A, and will introduce uh, Dr. Gavin Brooks. So thank you, Joyce, for for being here today. It's it's a real pleasure. Um, we will have around 15, 20 minutes for a Q and A uh, session before everybody is free to have dinner. If you are on a time zone where it is okay to have a dinner <laughs> right now, maybe it's breakfast for you or lunch, I don't know, depends where you are. So I would like also to thank uh, the University of Murcia and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and the Language Corporate Research Group for uh, sponsoring these, this talk uh, today as well. So without much further ado, I will hand over to Joyce Lim. Joyce, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hi, and welcome everyone. Um, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Gavin Brooks. Um, he is a UKRI Future Leader Fellow in the Department of Linguistics and English Language at Lancaster. Um, he's written numerous books and um, journal articles in the field of corpus linguistics, applied linguistics, discourse studies, and health communication. Um, today he'll be giving us a talk on how language is used to represent obesity in British newspapers. Um, and over to you now, Gavin. Thank you, Joyce. Um, thank you for the for the nice introduction, and thank you also, uh, Pasquale and 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 the whole team for uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to just try to share my screen now. Um, so, can you see um, my slides? Could somebody just give me a thumbs up or a yes or something? Oh, good. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Pasquale. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about some work uh, that I've been involved in, in uh, really over the last couple of years, um, examining uh, how language is used to represent the topic of obesity in uh, British newspapers. And uh, that's work that I've done with Paul Baker at Lancaster University. And, and for that, we've combined corpus linguistic and critical discourse uh, perspectives on that topic. So that's what the title of the talk is, and that's what I'm going to uh, share some of my findings on today. So. Uh, the talk is 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 based on a recently completed project, as I mentioned, and that project was called Representations of Obesity in the News, uh, and it was part of the ESRC Centre for Corpus Approaches to Social Science at Lancaster University. So the aim of the project was to examine the language around obesity in contemporary UK print media. Um, and as I mentioned, to do that, we combined uh, techniques from corpus linguistics with concepts from critical discourse studies. Um, there were four people working on the project. Uh, so it ran for two years between um, 2018 and 2020. Um, and the four of us working on it were Paul Baker, who I mentioned, who was the principal investigator. Uh, I was appointed as a uh, research fellow on the project, and then there were two other co-investigators, so Dima Atanasova, who's a linguist based in, um, in our department at Lancaster, uh, and Dima's done research on health and science communication in the media, 
Um, and then also Gareth Williams, who's a colleague from philosophy at Lancaster. And Gareth is interested in ethics and political theory. And he's carried out research on these issues in relation to uh, debates around childhood obesity in the past. So we were a bit of a, a, an interdisciplinary team, um, but most of the work was done by uh, Paul and I, who were working directly in the center at the time. So I want to begin this talk uh, by providing a bit of context around the issue of obesity. And first, it's worth noting that obesity is actually uh, rather a tricky concept to define, and it has lots of competing definitions, which all entail slightly different understandings of what obesity actually is. So this includes whether or not we consider it uh, a medical condition. And if it, is, if it isn't a medical condition, the degree to which obesity as a phenomenon actually exists. Generally speaking, however, um, the word obese is a clinical term that's used to describe a person who is very overweight and who has a large uh, amount of body fat. So the World Health Organization, who, uh, which recognizes obesity as a disease, defines it as excessive fat accumulation that may impair health by contributing to chronic diseases. Diagnosing a person with obesity isn't straightforward. So um, in the UK, which was the context of our research, the, the most widely used method for obesity diagnoses is body mass index or BMI for short. And this is a measure that correlates a person's weight with their height and then provides a score that indicates whether or not that person is a healthy weight for their height. Um, the system's received a lot of criticism and it's not very good, for example, uh, for dealing with people who might be quite muscular, um, so they weigh uh, a lot for their height, but they don't actually have a lot of body fat. They could still have a, a, lot, a, a high body mass index score, so it's a bit of a crude measure and it's been problematized for a number of, uh, of reasons uh, aside from that too. However we define it and, 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 and measure it, um, obesity constitutes or is widely recognized to constitute a major public health concern um, in many countries across the globe, including in the UK. So in the UK, it currently affects around a quarter of adults and around a fifth of children. And these figures are also predicted to grow um, with over half of adults in the UK predicted to be uh, obese by the year 2050. Obesity has been associated with the development of a wide range of health issues, including diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and also certain types of cancer. And all of this means that obesity can actually shorten a person's lifespan by as much as 14 years. Public health organizations across the globe have responded to obesity in numerous ways. And in the UK, the most visible response has been through uh, public health campaigns that are designed to encourage people to consume less sugary and fatty food and, and drink and to exercise more. So the most prominent of these types of campaigns has been the Change for Life campaign, which is where this image here was taken from. Rising rates of obesity in the UK have been mirrored by increased news reporting on the topic. Um, so this graph shows the number of UK national um, newspaper articles that mention the word obesity over a 10 year period. So that was the 10 years uh, going right up to the point where we um, uh, started our, our, our research and collected data. And in the main, the levels of coverage, as you can see, have, have risen, particularly since 2011. There's then a bit of a dip in 2017, um, and this is probably because the press became more interested in topics, in, in other topics around this time, like Brexit. Um, but also, if, if we extend this graph a bit further, we see that the dip continues a bit more as, as topics like COVID also begin to dominate the news coverage. There's a wealth of research into uh, media representations of obesity, and this has found media coverage to be alarmist and stigmatizing in general. While this research provides a useful knowledge base for our project, there are some important differences between what previous research has done and what we've tried to do in, 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 our, uh, in our work. So the first thing to note is that the majority of existing research has focused on entertainment media. So it tends to look at portrayals of obesity in sites like television and magazines. 
And more recently, there's also been research carried out on uh, depictions of obesity in social media sites like Twitter too. So studies of newspapers are surprisingly in the minority or have been. And most uh, uh, research, most of this research comes not from linguistics, but from other areas of the social sciences, like cultural studies and media and communication studies. And this research has provided plenty of useful insight into uh, obesity and, and, and language and, and representations around obesity. Um, but it's closer in its methodological approach to uh, content analysis than to discourse analysis. And so in this sense, previous researchers looked more at what is said about obesity rather than how it's said, so how linguistic choices are used to frame obesity and what the implications of these might be. There have been some uh, linguistic and discourse studies, um, though. Um, however, most of this research has been qualitative in focus, so it tends to be based on relatively small data sets, typically uh, comprising uh, fewer than 100 uh, newspaper articles in the case of, of media focused studies. So this research has been useful at helping to point to prominent issues in coverage and, and has been particularly effective at relating this coverage to wider social issues, so the particular socio-political context in which the coverage takes place. But it tells us less about trends and what's typical. Also, this research isn't comparative with respect to tabloids and broadsheets, as most studies look at either tabloids or broadsheets, uh, or it takes tabloids and broadsheets together, but sort of mixes them together into one homogenous data set. These studies also tend to be based on obesity coverage at a particular point in time. And that's usually uh, quite a long, uh, a long time ago in the past now, so uh, sort of over 15 years ago. Um, but given that levels of obesity have, uh, as we've seen, increased, and, and with that, the, the levels of media coverage have increased too, there's a rationale for looking at media coverage with data that's as recent and as up to date as possible. And that's what we try to do in our project. So in terms of our data, we assembled a corpus of all UK mainstream newspaper, uh, national newspaper articles, mentioning either the words obese or obesity over a period of 10 years. This data was obtained from the online newspaper repository LexisNexis and amounts to just under 44,000 articles and uh, around 36 million words, so quite a sizable specialized corpus. The data split fairly evenly between tabloids and broadsheets, so you can see that 52% of the words and the data are contributed by tabloids. And it's also worth mentioning that the corpus required a lot of cleanup uh, once we downloaded it from Nexus. So we had to remove lots of duplicated articles and noise uh, in terms of boilerplate text within articles that, that, that we had to take out. And maybe I can talk a bit about that in the, um, in the Q&A if we have time. So to handle uh, a data set this large, uh, we've used an approach known as corpus linguistics. So I'm assuming most people here will be familiar um, in, in, in the seminar series, but for the uninitiated, in case there are any out there, corpus linguistics is essentially um, a field of research, but also a set of methods that use computer uh, programs to search for linguistic uh, patterns in large collections of naturally occurring language data. So in this project, we use quantitative corpus techniques to establish recurrent patterns of representation around obesity in our corpus. Then we examine those patterns more qualitatively. And to do that, we draw on concepts from critical discourse studies in order to relate the representations that we observed to broader practices of text, produ text production and text consumption. So in practical terms, corpus linguistics provides us with a quantitative entry point, allowing us to downsample and to focus on words and patterns and texts of interest, while critical discourse studies enables us to look at similarities, uh, uh, to, to look at patterns, sorry, uh, um, at a more granular level, and then to interpret and explain those patterns in relation to ideologies and wider uh, societal discourses around obesity too. 
So in the project, we've approached the topic of obesity uh, representation uh, in our data from a variety of thematic and, and methodological perspectives. But today I want to share with you two parts of our analysis in particular. So first I'm going to compare how British tabloids and broadsheets represent obesity. And I'm particularly interested in three areas of representation here. So first I'll look at how obesity is defined uh, in the articles, then at what types of things are represented as causing obesity, and then finally at what the tabloids and the broadsheets suggest might be appropriate responses or solutions to dealing with obesity. Then in the second half of the talk, or perhaps slightly less than, than half, uh, the second part will be a bit shorter, I think, um, I'm going to explore uh, what types of gendered discourses are used to represent men and women with obesity in, uh, in, in the press, focusing in particular on narratives about weight loss published in British tabloids. So in terms of my first area of focus then, British newspapers can be defined along a number of criteria, including their political leanings, whether they're local or national, and the format that they're published in. And on this latter point, we can distinguish, distinguish between tabloids and broadsheets. So in the UK, tabloids tend to be physically smaller newspapers. They feature short articles and they usually focus on national stories and particularly stories that have some kind of celebrity interest. Tabloids also tend to employ a populist and informal writing style, which includes uh, using linguistic devices like puns and wordplay in their headlines. Broadsheets, on the other hand, tend to be physically larger newspapers. These contain longer articles that have more text um, and typically fewer images as well. Um, and they also focus more than tabloids on um, international news stories uh, and political analysis. And these generally employ a more formal writing style. Importantly, tabloids and broadsheets also tend to have different readerships. So while tabloids tend to be read by working class, lower income readers, broadsheets tend to be picked up by people in the middle classes. So uh, generally people who have professional jobs. Given their different readerships, Comparing how tabloids and broadsheets represent health issues like obesity, therefore has the added benefit of helping us to understand the types of health messages that, that, that might reach these different social groups and which might ultimately influence their health related beliefs and behaviors. So I think comparing across the formats uh, can be helpful in any corpus study of, of media, but it can be particularly beneficial when it comes to health, uh, the representation of health related issues. So in order to compare tabloids and broadsheets against each other, I used uh, the corpus linguistic technique of keywords. So the keywords technique essentially shows us words that are especially frequent in one corpus when we compare it against another. So in this case, I compared all of the articles from the tabloids against all of the articles from the broadsheets. So I got um, keywords for the tabloids by comparing them against the broadsheets, and then I got uh, keywords for the broadsheets by comparing them against the tabloids. So this gave me two keyword lists then. One that showed me the most characteristic words in the tabloids, and another that showed me the most characteristic words in the broadsheets when they were compared against each other. And this gave a lot of keywords, it was a large corpus, and, and this gave lots of keywords. So we took the top 100 keywords from each list and analyzed these more qualitatively using concordance. And this allowed us to interpret the keywords in terms of, of how they defined obesity and framed its causes and responses or solutions to it. And here we're talking about generally high frequency keywords, um, some of which occur many thousands of times. So this analysis is based on the most frequent patterns that we observed in samples of 100 texts for each keyword. Following this analysis, um, I then relate the obesity representations or frames that I identified in the, key, the use of the keywords to wider textual, discursive and social practices, including how the context in which the articles were produced and consumed uh, might influence their use. Um, and we also considered their implications from a public health perspective too. 
And this final stage of the analysis was key in terms of explaining the patterns that we observed, as well as interpreting their possible implications. Rather than provide you with a list of all of the keywords um, in one go, a list that no one will really be able to read or make a uh, head and a tail of, I'm instead going to jump straight into the analysis um, and talk about the different ways of framing obesity um, and flag up relevant keywords as I go. So onto the analysis. And the first aspect that I want to consider is how the issue of obesity was defined. Starting with the tabloids, these newspapers defined obesity as a biological or medical problem. So we found evidence for this in lots of tabloid keywords that denoted illnesses and diseases. And I've displayed all of the relevant keywords um, here at the top of this slide. Um, so these words were all particularly frequent or key in the tabloids compared to the broadsheets. So the tabloids are more likely to use words like blood, condition, diabetes, disease, inflammation, pressure, as in blood pressure, stroke, and symptoms. <clears throat> And when we analyzed these keywords in the context of use, we found that the tabloids tended to use them to label obesity as a disease or a condition. So in the top example from the newspaper, The Express, obesity is referred to as a disease and it's grouped together with inflammatory bowel disease. And this type of grouping together of obesity uh, with more established and less contested diseases uh, happens a lot across the tabloids and it involves diabetes and heart disease in particular. I should also mention here that I've selected all the extracts on, this, on these slides because I've judged them to be broadly representative of the relevant patterns or framings that I'm talking about. Um, and I've also highlighted the relevant keywords in red. But as well as being constricted as a disease itself, obesity was also framed as being the cause of other diseases. So here it's type two diabetes. But throughout the tabloids, obesity is also framed as causing heart disease, stroke, cancer, high blood pressure, liver disease, and kidney disease, among many others. Moving on to the broadsheets, and rather than being a medical problem, the broadsheets tended to frame obesity as a social issue. And this theme manifests in lots of different keywords, but I'll focus here on the most um, explicit ones, which I referred to as social issues keywords. And these include the words climate, housing, social, and society. The keyword social is used in lots of different senses, mainly to refer to social care. But when, but when it's used to define obesity, we see the recurring phrase social problem. And as this top example from the Telegraph shows, there's often a sense that the scale of the social problem is big and growing. The broadsheets also grouped obesity together with other uh, topical social problems like climate change and the UK's housing crisis, which is why we get the keywords climate and housing for the broadsheets. So in the bottom extract, obesity is listed as one of the biggest issues facing society alongside climate change and the need for renewable energies. Now, if you remember, we previously saw how the tabloids grouped obesity with diseases and other health problems like diabetes and cancer. So it's interesting then to see that the broadsheets instead list it alongside social issues like climate change and uh, housing shortages. In terms of what causes obesity, the tabloids uh, tended to focus on food and eating, and this was indicated uh, by the tabloid keywords calories, crisps, eat, eating, fat, food, and snacks, which again all occurred significantly more in the tabloids than in the broadsheets. Most of the time, the tabloids discussed um, high fat and, and sugary food and drink as the causes of obesity, uh, as in this uh, top example here from the mirror. Meanwhile, the keywords eat and eating also indicate a focus on practices of consumption specifically. So readers were often addressed directly, for example, through uh, pronouns like you, and told not only that what they were eating could make them obese, but also that how they were eating could make them obese too. So um, in the second example on this slide from the mail, readers are addressed directly through the pronoun you and told that eating too quickly will make them fat. As well as what and how people ate, 
The tabloids also framed uh, the causes of obesity in terms of biological processes. This discourse was scientific or at least scientific sounding um, and was indicated um, in uses of keywords that suggest a kind of tabloid preoccupation with the body's internal processes. So we get words, keywords such as brain, bacteria, cells, cholesterol, hormone and hormones. <coughs> Sorry, just take some water. Um, so the top extract here provides a good example of what this kind of discourse looks like, where obesity is framed as resulting from a hormonal defect, which means that the brain receives the message that the stomach is full more slowly in a person with obesity than it would in a person of healthy weight. The second type of discourse around these keywords is a little more extreme and not as common as the first. And this frames obesity as being caused by an infectious virus that makes fat cells multiply. And these types of claims tend to be made in the context of reporting around scientific research, which I think is intended to add some legitimacy to these types of, of potentially contentious propositions, which if they were presented in any other context might appear sensationalistic. So for the tabloids, Obesity is caused either by individuals eating too much or in the wrong way, or having some internal biological defect. The point here is that the causes of obesity for the tabloids are located firmly with or even within individuals, rather than considering wider environmental factors, uh, such as, for example, the junk food industry. But the broadsheets, on the other hand, did focus on these types of uh, environmental issues. So some of the broadsheet keywords indicated a theme of social inequality in, in accounting for the causes of obesity. So we get keywords like housing, inequality, and poverty. As the first two examples here show, poverty and inequality could be given straightforwardly as the causes of obesity. It's also notable that the first example quotes the government's public health minister, so a politician, rather than foregrounding the perspectives of scientists or even medical practitioners in the way that tabloids did. Um, and I'll come back to this shortly. The other keyword associated with social inequality is uh, housing. And this is an interesting case. We saw this keyword mentioned earlier in cases where the broadsheets, if you remember, the broadsheets grouped obesity with other social issues, um, and these included uh, climate change, but also uh, the UK's housing crisis. But the keyword housing was also used to index um, social inequalities associated with obesity. So this final example from The Guardian reads, it was discovered last week that the world's heaviest man was not in America, the junk food and obesity capital of the world, but in a housing association bungalow in Ipswich, eating takeaways and playing computer games. So in the UK, housing associations are non-profit organisations that provide low-cost housing for people in need of a home. So by mentioning this here, by mentioning the fact that this man lives in a, in a housing association bungalow, we'd argue that the Guardian is implying that this man's likely lower income working class status is in some way relevant to his obesity. The broadsheets were also more likely to explore the role of industries and big businesses in, in how they accounted for the causes of obesity and particularly rising obesity rates. So the broadsheet keywords also included words uh, like business, companies, company, corporate and industry. In most cases, the industries being um, blamed for, for causing obesity were uh, food and drink companies and soft drink manufacturers in particular. But as these extracts demonstrate, when the broadsheets talk about these industries, they actually focus more on the role of the government and the government's failure to properly regulate these types of goods and the ways that they're uh, marketed or advertised or even taxed. So having defined obesity and its causes, what do the keywords tell us about how, who the tabloids uh, and broadsheets think should be dealing with rising rates of obesity and how? 
Well, beginning with the tabloids, earlier we saw that the types of food that people ate and how they ate were framed as, as causes of potential causes of obesity. And so it makes sense then that the tabloids also framed individuals eating more healthily as a potential solution to obesity. And this was indicated by the tabloid keywords healthy, vitamin and diet, as well as in some uses of the keywords eat and eating that we saw earlier. As these examples show, healthy eating was often packaged alongside exercise as a means for people to manage their risk of obesity. And this message was framed both directly and indirectly as an instruction to readers, so an imploration to readers to eat better and exercise more in order to mitigate their obesity risk. And this also extends to looking after others too. For example, in uh, the second and third uh, extracts on this slide, um, we see adults responsibilized and, and parents in particular being responsibilized into ensuring that their children exercise and eat healthily in order to prevent uh, the development of, of obesity. Diet and exercise also form parts of tabloid narratives around individuals, often celebrities, who were once obese but who'd since reduced their weight through diet and exercise. We found evidence of these types of narratives in a wide range of tabloid keywords. So these included um, verb keyword, keywords that denoted weight loss, so words like uh, lo um, losing and lose and shed and slim and slimming, as well as words that denote the, the measurement and resultant quantification of the body and body fat, so keywords like dress size, pounds, stone, weighed, weighs and weight. And broadly speaking, there are two types of tabloid narratives around weight loss. The first are first person narratives, um, such as in this extract from the Express. And these types of narratives also help to account for, for why words like I, my and me were key in the tabloids compared to the broadsheets. However, more frequently, the tabloid weight loss narratives were presented in third person. And an example of this is a narrative uh, on, on this slide um, from uh, about a celebrity, sorry, uh, named Scarlett Moffat. So Scarlett Moffat came to prominence in the UK through her role on a reality TV show called Gogglebox, where essentially um, members of the public are filmed watching television programmes and then you can watch them watching TV. Uh, it's all very Orwellian. Um, anyway, a couple of years ago, Scarlett Moffat lost quite uh, a lot of weight and most of the tabloids and some other media outlets picked up on this. And I've picked this example because it contains a few of the keywords that relate to this um, theme, along with some of the hallmarks of these types of narratives. So this includes the use of positive evaluative language. So Scarlett's described as flaunting her newly uh, slimline figure. Her weight loss is described as impressive, and her desire to show off uh, the results of her fitness and diet plan is described as understandable. As well as this, Scarlett's reported on in the context of attending a party, which reflects a wider theme across these weight loss narratives, uh, whereby weight loss is constructed as improving individuals' social lives and as opening up their, their worlds, both socially and in some cases physically. So the people at the center of these weight loss narratives, like Scarlett Moffat and others, are glorified by the tabloids. They're presented in positive terms and they're even offered as role models to readers. And this is because these people, typically celebrities, but sometimes just normal members of the public, embody the ideal of the good neoliberal citizen. They're people who take it upon themselves to lose weight by exercising um, and eating more healthily. <clears throat> but diet and exercise weren't the only weight loss practices discussed in the tabloids, and some of the other keywords from this uh, half of the data denoted medical procedures, so we got keywords like bypass, gastric and surgery uh, in the tabloids. Unlike diet and exercise though, medical weight loss wasn't evaluated positively in the tabloids or even put forward as a desirable response to obesity. Broadly speaking, there are two types of stories about medical weight loss procedures in the tabloids. 
The first are horror stories about gastric band operations that go wrong, um, including in cases that result in people actually dying. And the second type of stories about how much these types of operations cost the National Health Service and, and by extension, how much they cost taxpayers. For example, this story on at the bottom of this slide from the mail is about a man who went on a TV show to talk about how he felt let down because the NHS refused him a gastric band unless he lost weight first. The article is quite negative in its evaluation of this man. So the headline asks rhetorically, so does someone force a donut down your neck? The article also foregrounds certain aspects of the man's identity that aren't really relevant to the story, but which help to construct the man as a financial burden. So he's described as unemployed. And then in the next sentence, we're also told that he's a father of six. The article also quotes viewers who took to Twitter to call the man um, things like lazy slob without presenting any alternative perspective from the man himself or, or social media or anywhere else. And for us, the reason why surgical responses to obesity appear to be so unpopular with the tabloids is perhaps captured by this extract from a position piece published in the mirror, which reads, there's a general feeling among overweight people that they don't have to make a concerted effort to lose weight because they can always fall back on gastric surgery. And perhaps this is it. Maybe people who want to undergo operations to lose weight are demonized by the tabloids because they're perceived to be putting in minimal effort and as expecting taxpayers to pay for them to have their operations. In other words, these people are presented as the very antithesis of the self-regulating neoliberal citizens like Scarlett Moffat, who the tabloids celebrate and build their positive narrative, narratives and success stories around. In contrast to the tabloids, the broadsheets tended to foreground governmental and political responses to obesity. And this was indicated by a raft of keywords, including Cameron, coalition, conservative, debate, funding, government, investment, labor, and so on. You can see them all at the top of the slide. And these were all key in the broadsheets as compared to the tabloids. And there was a notable distinction among the tabloids um, between how pro and anti-government newspapers framed uh, the government's responses to obesity. So, for example, the left-leaning anti-government guardian or anti-conservative government guardian suggests that rising obesity rates could be addressed through the introduction of a sugar tax, um, which is designed to make healthier foods more affordable than unhealthy foods. Now, this tax was introduced in the UK in the form of the soft drinks industry levy in 2016, However, prior to that, um, this uh, to the introduction of this so-called sugar tax, the Guardian criticised the government for failing to implement this measure and accused Ayrton and David Cameron in particular of not being hard enough on the junk food industry. <clears throat> on the other hand, the right-leaning pro-conservative broadsheets seem to be more supportive of Cameron's initial resistance to the sugar tax and they express some, uh, some skepticism about how effective such a tax might be. For example, the second extract from the Telegraph here argues that there is no credible evidence that the sugar tax would be effective in reducing obesity rates, and instead focuses on the adverse impact that such a tax might have on small business owners, even quoting here the head of the National Federation of Retail News Agents. Despite the fact that they clearly hold differing views on the sugar tax, whether left or right leaning, the broadsheets all did at least engage in these types of discussions and debates about the role of governments, tax and businesses in the context of obesity. And they did so much more than the tabloids. So to summarize so far, the tabloids tend to frame obesity as a medical problem, a disease even, that's caused by possible biological defects, but almost certainly by people not practicing effective self-care and, and lacking discipline with respect to their diet and exercise. From this view, obesity becomes a problem of personal responsibility. It's individuals who are responsibilized for making sure that they don't become obese. And then if they do, they're the ones who are responsible for addressing it by making positive health changes in their lives. The broadsheets, on the other hand, characteristically frame obesity as a social issue that's caused by what's often referred to as an obesogenic environment. 
And this is brought about by the failure of governments to adequately regulate junk food and sugary drinks industries, and also their failure to design urban spaces in ways that are more conducive to walking and cycling rather than driving or catching a bus. And the logic of the broadsheets dictate, dictates that since obesity is caused by powerful institutions like the government and junk food industries, it's those same powerful institutions that should be responsible for preventing and responding to it. Now, I have to stress here an important methodological point, and that is that the, the keyword approach shows us relative rather than absolute differences. So it's not the case, for example, that the broadsheets don't engage at all in the types of responsabilizing representations that we've seen in the tabloids. Rather, what we found is that the tabloids do that sort of thing a lot more than the broadsheets do. And likewise, it's not the case that the tabloids don't engage um, in, in at all in, the, in debates around the role of institutions like the government and food industries. They just do so a lot less than the broadsheets. So there are differences between the tabloids and broadsheets, but accounting for these um, can be a little tricky and we're forced to hypothesize a bit here. But it might be the case that in publishing shorter and more accessible articles, the tabloids provide an overly simplistic view of obesity. Similarly, apportioning blame to individuals might fit better with the more sensationalist style of the tabloids compared to the broadsheets, which also tend to provide more political commentary in general, not just stimulation to obesity. We can also consider the political leanings of these newspapers as a factor. So most tabloids in the UK are right-leaning in political orientation, and so they're more sympathetic to a neoliberal worldview. So some of the differences could be related to the differing discursive practices in the ways in which tabloids and broadsheets actually produce news. <clears throat> Whatever the case may be, the tabloid's promotion of a neoliberal rationality could be viewed as problematic when we bear in mind it's mainly lower income readership. Research suggests that individualized approaches to addressing health issues like obesity tend to be less successful with lower income individuals. And this is because the emphasis on personal behavior often fails to acknowledge um, that individuals' engagement in risky health-related behaviors isn't just down to a lack of awareness, but it often reflects the constraints of those individuals' environments and life circumstances. And th these are things that individuals often don't have the power to, uh, to change themselves. <clears throat> Another important consideration is the extent to which responsabilizing representations like these can function as a warrant for weight stigma. And this is something we've considered in further work that we've done comparing uh, news representations with reader comments, online reader comments. Perhaps what we need from the media then is an at least more balanced approach, which recognizes that if individuals are responsible for maintaining a healthy weight, their efforts can be greatly helped, but also potentially hindered by the actions of much more powerful institutions like the government and uh, junk food industries. So that was the first half of the talk, or not maybe more than half, let's say the first two thirds, perhaps. Um, and in the second chunk, I want to talk uh, of this talk, I want to consider the gendered discourses that are used by the British press to represent men and women with obesity. So a slightly more specific focus in this part of the talk. And for this purpose, purpose I'm using the term discourse here in, that, I guess, a sort of post-structuralist Foucault-inspired sense, and follow Jane Sunderland in viewing gender discourses as those discourses which establish boundaries of social practice through which appropriate gendered behavior is regulated, and which then provide parameters through which people are represented or expected to behave in particular gendered ways. So research in the social sciences has for a long time now called attention to the profoundly gendered nature of bodily practices and the discourses that constitute them. Initially, a key preoccupation um, was the emphasis placed by, the, uh, po by popular media on slim bodies as an ideal femininity. And critics of this contended that the types of slim bodies that, that have been presented as beautiful and sexually, desir sexually desirable in women uh, across, across media like magazines and advertising offer a limited and difficult to achieve body shape uh, as some sort of ideal to which all women are expected to aspire. 
And this research has also drawn connections between these types of slender body ideals and disordered bodily practices, including eating disorders and continual dieting, both of which affect women disproportionately more than men. Well, we can also observe similarly unobtainable bodily ideals in men, um, in, in, in media depictions of men, particularly ones with bulging biceps and washboard abs. Research on health and masculinity has tended to focus instead on the damaging role of hegemonic masculine norms, which place value on risk taking and the consumption of things like alcohol and red meat. As part of this, dieting and watching what you eat are widely viewed as things that aren't for men. And anecdotally, we can find evidence for this in the types of gender discourses in, in all corners of society. For example, where most alcohol products are marketed towards men, diet products tend to be marketed towards women. And recent research seems to suggest that these types of gendered associations aren't just a marketing bit, but they could actually influence how we think about and even conceptualize and potentially consume food. So this graph is adapted from a study by Emma Rowe at Southampton University. And what Rowe did in this study was gave all of her participants that were a mixture of men and women, a list of food items. And she asked them to indicate whether or not they thought the food item was masculine. And this bar chart shows the percentage of respondents, respondents who said that they thought each food item was masculine. Um, and I've ordered this to show the foods which were rated as most masculine on the left. And you can see the most masculine foods are dominated by meats. So we get beef, steak, venison, and lamb, all in the top five masculine foods, beaten only, of course, by beer, which is number one. Then we get the fish items, so tuna, fish, and shrimp a bit lower down, so they're slightly more feminine uh, in our perceptions, along with uh, fruits, green vegetables, barley, wheat, and things like that. And most worryingly for me is that chocolate and yogurt are at the bottom, which suggests perhaps for me personally that I have to reevaluate my masculinity, but there we go. So this kind of stuff is kind of fun, um, but the point here is that ideas about gender clearly intersect with the ways that we talk and probably also think about food and our bodies. So there's a rationale then for looking at how these types of ideas might inform the ways that the press talks about topics like obesity. That said, gender and obesity is surprisingly under-research, under sorry, from a linguistic perspective. Visual media like mainstream films and TV shows have received some attention from the media and, uh, and, and communication scholars, but the language of press reports less so. So I'm going to try and address that here. So here I'm going to share some of the uh, work we did about gendered weight loss narratives in tabloids. And by weight loss narratives, I mean, uh, you know, Th those types of articles which I talked about a little bit earlier, um, mainly published by the tabloids, which report on the weight loss of an individual. As I mentioned, these tend to focus on celebrities, but they can also focus on sort of normal members of the public. Um, and they're often multimodal, so they can contain these types of before and after images too. Importantly, these types of narratives are carefully selected and crafted by the editor uh, of the newspaper of the newspaper for that newspaper's imagined audience. So while these narratives reflect the experiences of individuals, they can't be treated as subjective disclosures or accounts of weight loss. They're highly mediatized texts. So for this analysis, I assembled two specialized subcorpora of weight loss narratives uh, derived from my large corpus of obesity newspaper articles. One uh, corpus uh, about uh, weight uh, of, of narratives uh, about women's weight loss and one um, corpus of articles which reported the weight loss of men. So to construct these corpora, I read through the articles uh, from the tabloids in our corpus uh, taken at random and I, I just took the first 100 weight loss stories about women and the first 100 weight loss stories about men that I came across. And as you can see, they're fairly evenly matched in terms of size. So the corpus of men's weight loss narratives contains just over 100,000 words and the women's just over 106,000. I should also mention narratives about women were much easier to find than narratives about men. I had to look for a, a, a lot 
uh, a lot longer and harder to find the stories about men, which fits with our wider uh, finding really that women are reported on in the context of obesity much more than men. So once I collected my two subcorpora, I then generated keywords for each of them by comparing each against the other. This gave me 68 keywords for the women's narratives and 64 keywords for the men's. I analyzed these keywords qualitatively and critically for representational patterns, and I was particularly interested in gender discourses. Okay, so starting with the women's narratives, the first set of keywords I want to talk about relate to the theme of motherhood. And I've put all of the relevant keywords on the left in order of keyness and with their frequencies in brackets. So this includes the keywords mum, pregnant, mother, surrogate, children, kids, pregnancy, and baby. So these keywords are all used in a variety of ways, but two patterns were particularly common. So one is a type of story about women whose motivation to lose weight was their desire to have children, like in this top example about the miracle gastric band baby. Most frequently, though, the motivation for mothers to lose weight was to in some way do better by their children and pregnant women to do better by their unborn babies. This also helps to explain the keenness of the word model, which uh, in, in the women's narratives, which tends to feature in accounts where mums describe wanting to be a good role model for their children, like in the second example here from the male. When women are represented in these roles and in relation to their children, it's consistently therefore in a position of responsibility and their weight and consumption practices are constricted as things that have ramifications for their children's health. And while we probably expect to find gender marked words like mum and mother as key in the women's narratives, the marked use of words like children and kids here compared to the men's narratives suggests that women are positioned as the primary caregivers in families in a way uh, that men aren't or, or at least are less frequently. Another set of keywords in the women's narratives uh, relate to relationships. So the top keyword here, wedding, recurs in stories about women who want to lose weight to fit into, uh, for their wedding or to fit into a wedding dress. And these stories have a familiar feel and recall what Sunderland describes as a fantasy discourse around weddings. So in this example, uh, a woman called Claire is reported as losing weight to fit into her dream wedding dress. And she describes feeling like a princess on her wedding day. Words denoting boyfriends and husbands could also feature in these narratives. And these male uh, social actors were portrayed positively in the main as being supportive about their partner's size and weight loss. But sometimes the encouragement betrayed a more problematic element and concern with appearance. So in this bottom example, Scarlett's boyfriend is described as comparing her to an iPhone with regular updates. And I won't even go into why that's problematic. But the point here is that the motivations for women's weight loss that we've seen here are all relational. They say as much about other people, including children and spouses, as they do about the women themselves. Added to this, the narratives about we weddings exhibit a concern with appearance and tend to focus on fitting into a dream wedding dress. And other keywords from the women's narratives indicate a more explicit focus on appearance. And I've called these aesthetic keywords. So the top keyword here, bikini, performs in a similar way to wedding dress on the previous slide, with, this, with the desire to wear a bikini acting as a motivation for the women to lose weight. And then typically images of the women wearing the bikinis would be um, offered on, in the articles as signals that they'd lost weight and gained confidence. Other keywords in this category provide positive evaluations of appearance. So we get keywords like stunning, beautiful, and amazing. While snap is used to orient readers' attention to photographs that the women have posted on social media that have then been reproduced in the articles. Another keyword that indicates a focus on physical appearance is look. And I've provided an example containing a couple of its uses here at the bottom of this slide. So the focus on the aesthetic can function as a motivation for women to lose weight in the narratives, but also to orient readers to the results of the weight loss, which are conceptualized in terms of the, uh, the women's resulting physical appearance and attractiveness. However, the motivations and results of weight loss in these narratives weren't just skin deep, as women's narratives also gave a number of keywords which indicated the disclosure of emotions and emotional states. 
So this includes keywords like felt and embarrassed. And these heightened levels of self-disclosure also help to account for a marked use of first person forms. So uh, words like I, my, me, and the reflexive myself were all key in the women's stories compared to the men's. In most cases, the feelings being described were negative. So feelings like embarrassment, shame, and a lack of confidence. Like in this top example, taken from an article about a teacher who was bullied by the children in her school because of her weight. The verb felt also conveyed more complex emotional states though. So uh, loneliness, for example, as in the second extract, where a woman's loneliness is connected to her weight gain. But it wasn't all negative as the narratives also describe more positive emotional states that typically occurred following weight loss. So in this bottom example, this woman describes feeling um, and looking great and fantastic and feeling much more confident in her body after she lost weight. Related to emotional disclosure, the women's narratives also express difficulties around the weight loss process itself. So the keyword tried tends to be used to describe multiple failed attempts to lose weight. And this frequently takes the form of lists of the various diets and weight loss plans that the women have attempted. So the woman in the top example describes trying a bunch of Weight Watchers, the Curves Plan, Keto, and switching to Paleo and Dairy Free, all in, in attempts to lose weight. The keyword desperate tended to be used to describe how desperate the women were to lose weight. And this is used either to, just, to describe multiple attempts, like in the top extract, or less frequently to set up a description of eating disorders or other disordered bodily practices. So this uh, bottom extract here is from a narrative about a woman who was so desperate to lose weight that she abused uh, laxatives. <clears throat> so moving on now to the men's narratives, and these keywords are characterized by an abundance of, of, of words denoting death and disease. So this includes words like diabetes, blood, cancer, type as in type uh, to diabetes, disease, death, liver, risk, insulin, and feared. And these words emerge as key because where in the women's narratives, weight loss was motivated by things like their responsibility to their family and emotional distress and a desire to look slimmer. For the men, weight loss tended to be triggered by health risks, particularly those that had been identified by doctors. So this top example contains, uh, extract contains examples of a few of these keywords and tells a story about a man who was rushed to hospital, diagnosed with diabetes and was at risk of coma. And this event serves as, as a turning point for this man to change his lifestyle and to lose weight. These types of articles also bear some of the hallmarks of the types of danger of death narratives described by Lebov. And it's here literally the threat of death that makes this man decide to address his body weight. Because we don't see these types of danger of death narratives in the articles about women's weight loss, it could be that they're related to a kind of stoic and heroic masculinity that's constructed around the men in these articles. In the second example, Britain's fattest man is warned by doctors to lose weight or die, which also helps to legitimize, legitimize his reasons for losing weight. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But the point here is that men's weight loss is frequently framed as being motivated by health concerns and as occurring in extreme circumstances, particularly when the men in question are faced with the prospect of death. Notably, despite the descriptions of life-threatening events, these narratives are also relatively devoid of emotional disclosure compared to the women's. The men don't describe being fearful, for example. Instead, emotion seems to be replaced with scientific reason. The decisions to lose weight are not stimulated by emotion or even necessarily concern about or responsibility towards their families, but rather they're made on the basis of logic and reason and advice from medical practitioners. Some relatives were mentioned in the men's narratives though, and we get keywords like father, wife, and brother. Sometimes the men in the articles are identified as fathers. However, this was a minority pattern. And in most cases, the fathers being referred to were uh, the fathers of the men who'd lost weight, where the death of their father was framed as causing overeating and, and as leading uh, to obesity. 
brothers were also described as dying, except that here the majority pattern was that the brothers' deaths inspired the men to make positive health changes and to lose weight. And perhaps here this, the distinction is, is a generational one. So because the brothers were in the same generation, uh, their deaths reminded the men of their own mortality. Again, what's notable in these cases is the lack of emotional disclosure. So in these examples, the men are hit hard, become a social recluse and are spurred on. But these accounts are in the third person. So if there is any emotion here, it's attributed to the men by the editorial voice or the voice of some female relative who's been interviewed as part of the article, rather than being presented as coming from the men themselves. The other family keyword, wife, was used in ways that again position men in the tradition women, sorry, in the traditional gendered role of family caregiver, including when it comes to preparing meals. So in this top example, a man attributes his weight loss to the fact that his mum used to cook his meals for him, but then he moved in with his wife and he was forced to fend for himself. Then the other two examples on this slide illustrate a kind of secret eater type of story where men describe eating meals behind their wives' backs. But the point here is that the women are again positioned as being responsible for the health of the, of the entire family. They're the ones who prepare meals and ensure that those meals are healthy. And so they're the ones who the men have to hide their misdemeanors and unhealthy habits from. Another key word for the men, and one that surprised us a bit, was diet. And this word was used in all kinds of ways, but one theme was that the men didn't diet, like in the top example, where uh, a man distinguishes between dieting and eating healthily. If the men did diet, then their diets were typically described as being unusual or extreme in some way, and often involved eating lots of meat. So in other words, the men either didn't diet at all, or if they did, then the diets would be framed as non-conventional and uh, involved eating lots of meat and high fat food. And this avoidance of using diet in the conventional sense manifested in the, the keyword experiment, where the men's unusual diets were uh, described as their experiments, like in this bottom example. By describing weight loss practices as experiments, the men's practices are not, on, not only distant from dieting, which might be perceived as we've, as we've mentioned as a feminine activity, but they're also uh, framed as a kind of scientific quest for knowledge, which resituates them within a, a, a traditionally masculinized domain. Meat wasn't the only thing that the men's diets or experiments preserved, and the final set of men's keywords I want to consider here relate to the theme of alcohol and drinking. This includes the keywords alcohol, beer, drink, and drinking. These latter keywords were also used to refer uh, to soft and sugary drinks too, and these were all, all, always portrayed negatively, so soft drinks were always portrayed as causing obesity and as being bad for health. However, the coverage of alcoholic drinks is more complex. So I've presented the findings from this bit of the analysis in a table. And this shows the five most frequent ways in which alcohol was represented in the men's narratives. And overall, this representation was actually quite positive. So most commonly, the articles talked about alcohol's health benefits, um, and that was in just over a quarter of cases. However, it wasn't all positive, and around 21% of cases discussed alcohol's uh, ad adverse health consequences, which included weight gain. The narratives also presented alcohol as something that should be stopped completely, but this was a minority discourse in just 6% of cases. And the articles were actually instead much more likely to, to advise limiting consumption or restricting consumption of alcohol uh, to certain conditions, like um, Christmas or the weekend or weddings, rather than advising men to stop drinking alcohol altogether. Now, it could be argued that this is a more realistic way of instigating behavior change, to encourage smaller and more achievable uh, modifications to behavior rather than a complete overhaul. However, when we consider that all of the mentions of soft drinks were negative, and that the articles constantly encourage readers to stop drinking soft drinks altogether, sugary drinks altogether. It seems that something different is happening with alcohol, where the newspapers seem particularly reluctant to present it in a completely bad light, at least in stories about men. 
So in conclusion then, um, weight loss narratives in the tabloids re recycle prominent and long-standing discourses around femininity and masculinity. For women, weight loss is framed as a means for them to perform their role as primary caregivers in the family, as well as allowing them to aspire to a slender ideal feminine body type. The women's accounts were also characterized by emotional disclosure, with weight loss serving a sort of cathartic function to help the women overcome feelings of embarrassment and shame and to gain confidence. The men's stories, on the other hand, bore many of the hallmarks of what Connell describes as hegemonic masculinity. Emotional disclosure was replaced by logic and reason, and weight loss took place to prevent death and disease, particularly following medical advice. Although the articles about men talked about diets more than those about women, the diets that the men engaged in weren't really diets at all, for, for instance, being framed instead as experiments. The men's reported weight loss regimes also helped to maintain some of the staples of masculine diets. So uh, if men were losing weight, they were doing so uh, by eating lots of food, especially lots of red meat, and still drinking alcohol. It's important to bear in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that these aren't faithful accounts of weight loss, but instead they're highly edited media texts that have been carefully constructed with particular target or imagined readerships in mind. And this might be why the newspapers rely on traditional and, and frankly quite old fashioned gendered stereotypes like emotional women and stoic and rational men. And this is perhaps because these newspapers might perceive uh, these ideas to be more consonant with their older uh, imagined readers. But of course, as well as reflecting society, media texts also have the potential to shape and dictate social norms. And from a public health perspective, these kinds of gendered norms haven't done women's or men's health much good in the past. For women, Intense focus on slenderness has been linked to weight-related anxieties and eating disorders. Meanwhile, for men, over-reliance on hegemonic masculinities could promote the idea that men are invulnerable, emotionally detached, and should only address their health concerns when they are at risk of very serious illness and, and even death. And this latter point is of a particular concern where men are concerned uh, because men tend to present with symptoms for serious illness much later than women. Um, and in many cases, this can reduce their chances of recovery. The public would, I'd argue, be better served than by obesity coverage, which either challenges these harmful gendered discourses, or which at least incorporates a wider range of gendered identities, rather than relying on a narrow range of very rigid and traditional assumptions about gender roles. Not all men are beer swillers, and not all women are the primary caregivers in families and base their health decisions around their families or their ability to squeeze into a wedding dress or a bikini. So perhaps more uh, a picture which reflects more contemporary and more fluid uh, gender identities would do all of our health a little bit better. And there I can stop. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Uh, we have a number of questions um, and I tried to sort of compile them. Um, so the first question here is, were there any ethical decisions made regarding newspaper articles included in the Corpus ad hoc? And how did you ensure that the use of these articles in your study is ethical? That's a good question. Um, it, I think ethics is always an important thing to bear in mind when we're designing a corpus. Um, in our case, um, we didn't really have an ethical, uh, any ethical um, challenges when it came to collecting these texts. These were all publicly available mass consumption texts um, that are uh, easily and freely downloadable from, from a, uh, in our case, LexisNexis, but you could find them through, through um google searches for example so we didn't have any ethical consider any particular ethical considerations around the text themselves but of course there are other types of ethical considerations that go with studies like this so beyond text collection you also want to talk about um the particular populations and that that you're researching in our case people with obesity so people who in some ways represent a, a vulnerable population um, uh, uh, in society 
in ways that are respectful and that limit harm and that do good and, and that help those people. So that's something that we've been conscious of. And as part of that, we work with uh, an obesity charity in the UK as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps to, to uh, illuminate some of those considerations. Thank you. Um, the next question here is, what kind of softwares or tools did you use to extract the keywords? And why did you use the log likelihood method? So we used CQP Web. So that's um, a tool that I'm sure lots of people here will be familiar with. And it's a tool that we use a lot at Lancaster, um, uh, particularly with research in CAS. So it's a powerful um, uh, corpus workbench where you can mount a corpus uh, and then uh, you can access it uh, remotely through, uh, through an online interface. Um, so that's what we used. Uh, there's a paper on introducing CQP Web in the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics uh, that was authored by Andrew Hardy, who, who develops and maintains the tool. Um, in terms of keyword generation, um, there are lots of different um, statistics that can be used to, to measure keywords, of course. We use log likelihood. Um, because it gave it gave us the types of keywords that we wanted it gave us high frequency keywords that were widely dispersed across the text in our corpus um, and they were helpful for us uh, to, to characterize the discourse so while log likelihood might be less appropriate for some other uh, for the generation of keywords in, in some other contexts for us kind of descriptive and critical purposes it, it was it was a helpful measure great thank you um, the next question here is, did you use um, corpus linguistics collocations to determine the framings or was it a uh, more manual analysis? And if it's the latter, what was your methodology? So for the, um, for the, uh, across, the, so, so, so from this, uh, from the work that we did as, as part of this research program, um, we looked at obesity, as I mentioned, from a range of perspectives, and, and Paul Baker and I and a couple of other colleagues have published a few journal articles on that. Um, and Paul and I published a book where we've, we've brought together all of the, the different strands. Um, and in some sections of that book, we did use collocation. Um, so uh, in, in, for example, in looking at... Uh, stigmatizing language so we were interested in words that we used to label uh, people with obesity and also uh, describe and evaluate their actions and attributes um, that were attached to them in the discourse so for that purpose um, collocation was really helpful so we have a chapter on that in the book for the analysis i presented today uh, we didn't use collocation we used uh, i guess a more qualitative concordance analysis um, and the approach that we used uh, was sort of inspired really, in terms of the framework was inspired really by uh, sort of a framing uh, uh, analysis, frame analysis. Um, so uh, that was a, a method devised by Entman to look at media texts, how media texts frame certain social issues. And recently it's been applied in linguistic research as well, particularly in health. So by people like Nalia Kotako and Dima Atanasova and Elena Samino. And we use that approach to, to categorize the uses of the keywords based on qualitative analysis uh, through concordance. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Um, if you have found any keywords in either type of newspapers regarding the influence of obesity on social relationships or how people should perceive obesity, um, for example, like bullying, body shaming, or plus size is also beautiful, and et cetera. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so we did get, um, we, we did see some descriptions of uh bullying for example in the the weight loss narrative so often people would be described as being bullied um and then they lose weight and and then that they, they enjoy more so positive social relations so um they then be pictured going out to parties and things and those activities would be described so in many ways weight loss was framed as something which could op could cease things like bullying and open up people's worlds um socially and in some cases physically one issue that we had with that uh was that often 
the bullying behavior was very rarely, if ever, challenged in the first place. So if there was a redemptive aspect of those narratives, it was it was that that now the bullies looked silly because the person being bullied had lost weight and looked great. But in a way, that's a really uh, problematic message because, um, of course, it would be more helpful to challenge the bullying behavior in the first place. And it's almost as if the bullies win then if, if somebody has to do what the bullies want and look the way the bullies want them to look in order to say, OK, now I win. We're not sure whether whether that's a victory at all. Um, in terms of more sort of uh, body positivity and fat positivity, um, there was very little in the corpus at all. And that was something that surprised us. Um, if it was talked about, it tended to be evaluated quite negatively as something that could encourage weight loss. And that was viewed as something that was that was uh, that was viewed in a negative way that was problematized. But generally, there wasn't much from that position. Um, I'll just add as well in, in the book, one one thing that we did look at was uh, we also looked at online comments under mm -hmm. some of the articles and one thing we found was that in general the discourse in the online comments was much worse than the discourse in the articles and um, in some cases readers would explicitly advocate things like bullying and fat shaming as a way to sort of motivate people to lose weight so um, we could see a relationship between the articles and, and the comments but the comments tended to be much worse or went further um, than the articles did. Okay great thank you. Um... Next question here, given the data, have you analyzed whether different groups are represented differently? So for example, different age groups, nationalities, and um, so forth. That's a good question. So we didn't look at, uh, we didn't really look at age groups. I guess children came in uh, at different points in the analysis, childhood obesity, but in terms of adults, we didn't really look at different age groups. Um, Obviously, as I presented today, we did look at, at gendered representations, so particularly uh, representations of men and women. Um, in addition to that, we also looked at um, social class based representations. So we looked at how people at different levels of social class were represented, so working class, middle class or upper class or even underclass, um, and how those four different groups were represented with respect to obesity. I think we found some interesting differences and some patterns there, so that's covered in the book. Um, in terms of sort of nationalities and ethnicity, we didn't really look at those uh, in, in, in the book. Um, they didn't come up so much. Sometimes, um, sometimes they did, uh, ethnicity came up intersecting with social class. So you'd have um, white, poor white children, for example, were, um, were framed as being particularly uh, at risk of, of developing obesity. So we saw some kind of intersectional aspect there. Um, but actually, the, the ethnicity angle is something that we're pursuing more in, in follow-on work, potentially, that we're doing with Monica Badnarek from the University of Sydney, uh, where we're comparing UK and Australian framings. And one thing that we're anticipating from some of our sort of um, precursory analysis, if you like, is that there's more of a focus on different nationality groups in the Australian press as compared to the UK press. That's something that we want to look at in a bit more detail. Great, thank you. Um, and there's a question leading off of that about the graph with the gendered um, food groups. Um, do you think that these connections may be culturally related? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think they're entirely culturally constructed. I think um, there's, there's as, as far as I'm aware, there's, there is nothing inherently masculine or feminine about any of those food groups, you know, just as gender itself is a social construct, so too are the are, the, uh, the associations between gender and and food um the uh, and, and with that said um of course the study that that i quoted that looked at that that survey study by Roe was based in the uk as was our analysis and it might be the case that if you carried out that kind of study in a different cultural context the results might look quite differently and and with that then we might see different types of discourse around food eating and and gender as well in those contexts so it is culturally constructed and with that it might be culturally contingent to some extent as well yeah thank you uh, i think we have time for one more question um could you please expand how you form the gender discourse sub subcorpora according to gender? How did you mark or annotate these texts pertaining to male or females? 
Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, um, well, I, uh, so for this um, analysis, uh, at first I considered, first of all, I wanted what, 100 weight loss stories about men and 100 weight loss stories about women. I knew that these types of stories were more, uh, much more common in tabloids. So I focused on tabloids rather than broadsheets. But then um, beyond that, uh, I, I just took a, an approach of taking the tabloids around. I randomized all of the texts in the corpus and just took the first, read through them and took the first 100 articles uh, that, that told, that were that told a weight loss story about a man and a, the first 100 that told a weight loss story about a woman, if they told the story about both or couples, for example, I excluded them. Um, and I didn't really mark them up. I didn't annotate them. I just stored them separately as two separate subcorpora um, and analyzed them, re-uploaded them into CQP web and analyzed them separately that way. But um, it was a bit of a the, the manual approach was a bit of a of a painstaking one. It was a bit boring, particularly to find the, the ones about men because they were much less frequent than women. I probably could have got two or 300 stories about women before I got 100 about men, taking them at random. But I didn't want to impose any linguistic criteria. I didn't want to search for any words that, even though I had a hunch that they might lead me to narratives, I didn't want to shape the corpus uh, according to linguistic criteria because then I thought I might just get particular types of stories um, and I wanted to be open to, to any type of story that might come regardless of, of its kind of linguistic profile I guess. Awesome yeah um, I'm sorry that I didn't get to all of the questions um, but thank you so much Dr. Gavin Brooks for a wonderful presentation um, yeah well I myself really enjoyed it I'm sure a lot of people here also enjoyed so thank you so much for that. Um, passing over to Pascual now. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Gavin. And thank you, everyone, that um, uh, posted questions, so many interesting questions. Uh, maybe you can share these questions uh, uh, on, on Twitter, and uh, I'm sure that Gavin <clears throat> will be very, um, very um, keen to uh, engage with some of those questions if you want to do that, of course. So I think this has been a fascinating uh, webinar today, a fascinating talk, lots of engagement in this talk, so many interesting questions. Gavin, thank you so much. I'm sure that you have inspired today <clears throat> so many PhD students that I know are in the room and so many of us uh, as well. So uh, thank you again for your generosity and uh, thank you again that uh, popped up today. Oh no, thank you. I hope I hope you're right, and thank you everyone for listening. I, um, you've been, a, a, as far as I can tell, a fairly captive audience. So yeah, thank you everyone, and thank you Pasquale as well for the invitation. And then good luck and good work on the on the rest of the series. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>